Well, good evening. Thanks for coming. Um, it's always um, fun to do these lectures because I learned so much uh, in preparing. Uh, and, I, and I, whenever I give a lecture, it's not, I wish I'd known you were going to make it. <laughs> it's my partner, Lee Pearson. Um, I left my laser pointer. I would have you. So at any rate, so um, it's always fun to do this because I learned so much in preparing for these lectures. Uh, Rick Latham, as Mike mentioned, who started the program here, was in the military with me. He was a year ahead of me, and he was actually my mentor when I did my uh, research to finish my fellowship in cardiology. A uh, brilliant um, physician, and uh, for professional reasons, I, I came here to work along with Rick, uh, who left a few years later um, to go to Idaho Falls. Uh, my plan was to, to do a couple of things. Um, there was a Venus transit um, in June of 2012, so I came in April in 2012 knowing that Fairbanks was one of the best places on Earth to see the Venus transit. So I came for that, and on the way here I saw, I would stop to see in New Mexico uh, a solar eclipse. So my plan was to stay three years and then leave, but it's been uh, 11 and a half years now, and I'm <laughs> and, uh, very happy that I stayed. Um, Mike called me a few months ago uh, and, and said, uh, maybe six or seven months ago, and uh, invited me to speak again and suggested that I would talk about determining uh, the risk of cardiovascular disease, um, which is a, a very good topic. Uh, I was thinking about something else that we won't get into. It has to do with aging, but we'll get to that maybe next year or the year after. But I think this is a very good topic because we are, as a nation, we are in trouble. Uh, it's predicted that by 2035, half of Americans will have a diagnosis of cardiovascular disease, and that is awful. Uh, we have to do something about that. So we have to determine the risk, who is at risk, and try to reverse that risk, reduce that risk, and uh, reverse cardiovascular disease. Um, we'll see this slide again, but I wanted to show you here these yellow particles. That this is low-density lipoprotein, LDL. And LDL can become a bad actor when it crosses the endothelium in a blood vessel and enters um, the, the wall of the artery. If it becomes modified or oxidized, then it's not recognized as being part of the body. So the body would send in white blood cells to attack it, but it can't do anything with it. The lysosomes, those chemical factories in the white cell would burst open and cause inf inflammation. These cells coalesce. As they engulf, uh, engulf the lipids and uh, the cholesterol, they become foam cells. They coalesce and form a fatty streak within an artery. This fatty streak can begin occurring in, uh, in our teenage years. And with time, this plaque can become vulnerable. The plaque can rupture and cause a heart attack. The next slide is um, was taken from the autopsy from Tim Russert, you know, face the nation, who died suddenly when he was um, 58 years old. Can you play that harp? So this is from his autopsy. They found a plaque. And this depicts what happened to Tim when he died suddenly. <coughs> Plaque ruptures, blood flow stops, and then it's the ventricular fibrillation. Now, Tim had had a, um, Tim had had a uh, exercise stress test. Um, a year or two before this event, and the stress test was normal. He also had a coronary calcium score, and at that time he was about 48 years old when he had the coronary calcium score. His score was about 220, and for a 48-year-old man, that's very high to have. A, generally, a score of 400 is uh, considered to be extremely high, but at age 48, a score of 220 placed him in the 90th percentile. And we know that if you're in the 90th percentile with a coronary calcium score, uh, there's a 10-15% chance that one would have an event within a year 
or within 10 years to have a major event. So if someone has a high score, uh, there's no need to panic, but one should do, make some lifestyle changes. Um, you start an inflammatory, uh, uh, non-inflammatory diet, uh, exercise, if one smokes, stop smoking, things of that sort. So um, it's important for us to determine what the risk is. Now, there are risk assessment tools that, that we do use, and we'll go over some of those, and I'll tell you about the one that most of the physicians use in, in the United States. We talk about the importance, or the lack thereof, of body mass index, or BMI. A few words on metabolic syndrome, and then we'll talk about lipoproteins and atherosclerosis. And in fact, I'll mention too that if you, uh, when you see your primary care physician, and you might ask for certain ones to, to be measured that we don't normally measure, but in the future we will begin to measure more and more often. And then we'll talk about the coronary calcium score that, that we do have available uh, at a much better price now at, at FMH as of today. Um, yeah. Uh, the price went down from, went from 500 down to 125. Um, and, um, but with that, the hospital won't lose money because we're going to find patients who need more testing. And we're going to find significant disease in asymptomatic people and we'll be able to affect the change in, in, in the lives of individuals who don't want to be caught off guard with a heart attack at a time where you could be enjoying other things in life. So um, these are various scores that we can use. Framingham Risk Score that we used, used to use many years ago. There's a Reynolds Risk Score, Q Risk, and Score of the uh, Systematic Coronary Risk Evaluation used in Europe, and also the ASCVD Risk Estimator, which most of us use uh, at this time. The Framingham Score is one that was developed uh, originally in this country uh, based on the Framingham study that started in uh, uh, 1948, and uh, individuals in Framingham, Massachusetts have been followed for decades and looking at their outcomes, and there's a scoring system uh, that's used. For instance, for women, uh, the calculator, you could see here, if you take a woman age 70 to 74, you get 14 points, uh, total cholest uh, uh, cholesterol um, of about between 160 and 169, you get, uh, there was no points for that. Smoker, one point. Um, systolic blood pressure, 130, 139, four. Then you add all of these up and score of 19. Ten-year risk of having a heart attack or stroke, 8%. And that's considered intermediate risk. Uh, and there was also a table for, for men. And what's interesting is that at a lower score, men would have a higher risk. And, but we all know that actually more women die of heart attacks in life than the men. But... Um, Early on, until about age 74, men exceed women in terms of, of heart attacks. And in fact, with coronary calcium scores, it's unusual for us to see coronary calcification in a woman under the age of 50, whereas for men, it's under the age of 40, which is unusual. So we begin to calcify earlier, and we don't live as long. Um, however, if we take steps to determine our risk, and make some modifications, then maybe we can actually begin to live as, as long as women. But anyway, uh, at above age 74, 75 up, women take over in terms of the sheer number of individuals having uh, heart attacks. Another sad fact is that presently, we, uh, throughout this country, there are just as many people under the age of 65 having cardiac events as those are over the age of 65. So it, it is really, um, and so for, there was a, a time where the events were going down, but now they're leveled off and they have begun to go up again. So with the Reynolds risk score, uh, it was based on a study that looked uh, at improving algorithms for the uh, assessment of global cardiovascular risk in women. So it was a scoring system that was supposed to uh, um, identify women who were at higher risk. They added C-reactive protein, the inflammatory factor, and also a family history. Uh, but it was never very popular. The Q risk used in the United Kingdom. What's interesting about this um, is that with their risk scoring, they also included schizophrenia and also uh, taking antipsychotic medications. Um, 
what we know about schizophrenics is that they have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease than the average population and actually uh, end up uh, during living uh, average lifespan of 10 years less than the average population because of cardiovascular disease. And in terms of uh, antipsychotic medications, there's a risk of sudden death. So they include that with their risk scores also. And um, the other one used in Europe is the uh, systemic coronary risk evaluator. Uh, all of these scores look at a 10 year risk for developing cardiovascular disease. And the most common um, risk estimator using anastasis is the ASCVD risk estimator. You can go on, online and just pull it up and plug in your blood pressure, your cholesterol level, your gender, your race, and um, smoking history, whether you're diabetic or not. And um, it will give you a, uh, the percent chance of developing a cardiac event within 10 years. And what do we do with this information? Well, if the risk is less than 5%, one is considered to be low risk for a cardiac event. If it's between 7.5 and 20, that's intermediate risk. And at this point, generally, um, a statin is recommended unless someone can lower the cholesterol to appropriate levels just with exercise and, and lifestyle changes. Even at 5 to 7.5, uh, a statin is considered. And if it's greater than 20%, that's someone who has high risk for a cardiac event within 10 years. And statins are recommended, and it's also recommended that for those individuals who don't want to take a statin, who would say, well, let's do a coronary calcium score, and if the score is zero, then I don't have, the chances of having significant plaque is very low, then why not just stay off a of statin? Well, if one has a coronary calcium score that's zero, and you're at this level, five to 7.5 percent, then statin may not be recommended. Um, and even intermediate risk if your score is zero, but anything above zero, a statin is recommended. Now, there can be an argument against that too, and that is um, there's still a two, maybe three percent chance that one can have soft plaque and not any calcified plaque. So. Um, one has to take that in consideration. However, zero is powerful, and we'll look at that in a few minutes. Let's move on to body mass index. But well, the BMI is a tool that's used to assess whether a person's weight is in a healthy range. That's what it's uh, supposed to be used for. And uh, the person might be at risk for weight-related health diseases if it's elevated. And uh, a healthy BMI is considered to be between 18.5 and 25. If it's between 25 and, 20, and 29.9, then one is considered to be overweight. And if it's above 30, then one is considered to be obese. One problem with this is that this score was based on actually the uh, Quetelet index that was first proposed by Adolf Quetelet in 1832. Quetelet was the mathematician and actually in his original thesis, he was evaluating um, man. And in part of the, the, um, his discussion, he said, now, if a physician should run across a, a child who's died, how does one determine how old that child was just by looking at the body size? So he did a lot of mathematical equations looking at how we grow and determined that um, as we get to a certain age, the relative body weight is a ratio of weight in kilograms over the height in meters squared. And he went through a lot of different formulas to come to, to that one. And uh, later, in 1972, Anson Keyes who, uh, and his colleagues uh, decided that that ratio was probably the better one to use, but he decided to call it body mass index. And, um, and he felt that this index was ideal for all human populations, um, which we now know is not necessarily true. But if the BMI is correct, if someone does have, I'm sorry, did you raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> if the BMI is correct, if one does have adiposity and actually a distribution of, of fat that's in bad places like around your organs, 
then what are some BMI-related health problems? Well, uh, premature death, cardiovascular disease, osteoarthritis, high blood pressure, some cancers, and, and even diabetes. Now, in 1993, the World Health Organization uh, decided that the a cutoff level of 25, point, uh, 25 kilograms per meter square was, uh, was the cutoff for a normal BMI, 18.5 up to 25. Those above 25 overweight, those above 30 BMI obese, and above 40 morbidly obese, and there's another category of the super obese with BMIs above 50. But these numbers were based on data obtained from mainly white populations. So if we look at, in terms of the importance of BMI, then a BMI can provide a general indication of a person's body fatness, and this may potentially correlate with health conditions. And the reason why it may potentially, but not definitely, correlate in any given individual is that your BMI may be elevated because you're muscular. Your BMI may be elevated because you have a lot of lower body fat, which is not dangerous. It's the upper body or the, uh, the fat uh, the, in the, the midsection and around the organs that's, that's dangerous. So the BMI may not, this does not tell us about fat distribution, which is very important. Um, so BMI, in terms of looking at populations though, uh, that's meaningful, right? Because if you have a country where the BMIs are very high, then you'll actually find quite a few people who have um, adiposity in the wrong places. And uh, it can be used as a screening tool in some places, but we shouldn't overlook other measurements. So in terms of individual, uh, there are variations in terms of fat distribution, in terms of body composition. And there is a test that we can do um, that cost $75 at the hospital, actually, and you, uh, it's a DEXA scan for body composition. So many of you all may have had a DEXA scan to uh, screen for osteoporosis. Well, that same scan can be modified to look at body composition in terms of the distribution of fat uh, in the body. So I think it's a worthwhile thing to do. Um, if we look at ethnicity and age, the BMI varies, and I'll show you a study in just a moment looking at that. And um, if we focus mainly on BMI, we may overlook other things. So that should not be our major focus, but if the BMI is elevated, then one should say, well, why? Is it because a person is a mesomorph, someone who's muscular, or is it really because we have adiposity in the wrong places? Here's a study from um, England uh, looking at um, BMI cutoffs based on ethnicity in terms of the risk of developing diabetes. In this study, there were 1.3 million white adults, so about 76,000 South Asian, 49,000 blacks, 11,000 Chinese, about 3,000 uh, Arabs. And of this group, 97,000 developed diabetes. And what they determined was that, well, let's go back here. Is that going back? I don't think it's going back. Here we go. Good. Okay, so what was determined is that the cutoff BMI for obesity was 30 uh, in the white population. Now, the cutoff in terms of where diabetes was at a risk for these different groups. The cutoff was 30 uh, for, for whites. It ended up being 28.1 for the black population, about 26.9 for Chinese, 26.6 for Arabs, 23.9 for South Asian adults. And um, the cutoff of a BMI in terms of being overweight, 25 in white adults, translated to a BMI of 23.4 in blacks, 22.2 in Chinese, 22.1 in Arabs, and very low at 19.2 in South Asian adult, uh, adults. So BMI in general, you just can't take one number and apply it to different races. Uh, we vary in terms of body build and in terms of the importance of the, of the BMI. So there are other parameters that one can measure, the waist circumference, waist to hip ratio, waist to height ratio, 
These all uh, independently have an increased risk for heart failure depending on the, the levels, but none of these add anything more than looking at BMI. This is an example of what the DEXA scan results will, will show us in terms of the distribution of fat in an individual. And with this, though, it would also give you the percentage, the percent of body fat that one would have, you know. Does that um, show uh, your fat also? Yes, yeah. it sure does, yeah. It shows, it shows the, all sorts of different parts of your body. It, it sure does. Are, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's really worth doing. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Um, it couldn't work me in today. Yes. It's only $75. Uh, it, did, it does not cover this. It does cover DEXA scan for osteoporosis when it's ordered, but just to look at your body composition, um, they consider that, that you're vain and you just want to look great. And, oh, but it's only $75, and uh, so you don't have to have a doctor's order for it. Yeah. Um, yes. No, you don't. I'm going without one tomorrow. <laughs> um, so if we look at that, so this is a very good study. Um, this is a study looking at people with a normal BMI, and it looked at the association between regional body fat and cardiovascular disease. Uh, in postmenopausal women, these are women who had taken part in the national in the um, in the uh, Women's Health Initiative, and so there were normal BMIs, eighteen point five to twenty five, and um, what was found, and they looked at cardiac events in these patients over uh, a period of time, or over about seventeen, uh, eighteen years, they found they had a higher percent of trunk fat combined with a lower percent of leg fat was associated with particularly high risk of cardiovascular disease with a hazard ratio of 3.3, um, which is um, pretty significant. Um, and this is in individuals with a normal BMI. So I really think that we should all get the DEXA scan, despite having pretty good BMIs. Um, and so, um, Here it is, the incidence of cardiovascular disease events, including coronary heart disease and stroke, were associated. And this is the, the number of patients that they looked at in that study. So health risks may or may not be associated, associated with high risk, uh, with high BMI. Adipose tissue distribution determined, uh, determination is more important. So that's why I would endorse doing uh, the hydro scan, uh, the DEXA scan. Now, um, for individuals above the age of 65, if you look at your BMI, I just want to mention there is a, uh, so on this calculator, I put in 25 years of age for this calculator for uh, adults over 65, and it says this calculator is intended for people who are at least 65 years old. Uh, so but there is a, uh, and in fact, this suggests, and it's based on a, a study that was done, that a BMI up to 29.9 is acceptable for individuals over the age of 65. Um, that's been looked at in terms of uh, BMI is slightly above normal in individuals over the age of 65, and what was found was that there, there was lower mortality in individuals with a slightly higher BMI, but why? It may be that in a normal BMI, a low BMI group, that there were more cases of cancer. Um, no one really knows. Let's talk about the metabolic syndrome now. This is a combination of metabolic abnormalities that would increase one's risk for developing um, uh, diabetes or heart disease. And there are several factors that we look at with, um, well, why is that not advancing? Well, obesity, alcoholism, and sedentary lifestyle are some risk factors for developing metabolic syndrome. And uh, if we manage our, our lifestyles with um, proper eating habits and and in some cases, you know, of course, having to take medications, then we can reverse this. So you have to have three or more of these uh, to make a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. That is, a waist circumference of greater than 40 in a man or more than 35 in a woman, uh, triglyceride level above 150, 
low HDL. If the HDL is less than 40 in a man or less than 50 in a woman, then that's not good. Blood pressure above 130 over 85. Fasting glucose greater than 100. So we have three out of five, then one has metabolic syndrome and one is at increased risk for going on to develop diabetes or cardiovascular disease. You know, frequently we have our cholesterol levels checked and in, in the usual panel you get a total cholesterol, HDL, and triglycerides. And, um, but one can, through uh, specialized testing, uh, you can do things like look at LDL particle size. However, um, in the future and presently, more and more physicians will begin ordering uh, apolipoprotein B levels and also LP little a. Um, the reason for this is that when we look at these harmful particles coming in, all the atherogenic particles have attached to it apolipoprotein uh, B. So if you measure that, you're accounting for all of these particles that are atherogenic. The atherogenic particles include LDL, large and small, the um, particularly small dense LDL, but it also the, uh, the um, intermediate density lipoproteins, remnant, uh, VLDL remnants, VLDL, chylomicrons, all of these are uh, atherogenic. And all these particles that are atherogenic have an APOB associated with them. So if we measure that level, and it's not extremely expensive. Um, it, insurance companies would, would generally cover it with a proper diagnosis, right? If someone has um, hyperlipidemia or coronary artery disease, um, but it may cost $20, $30, whatever. Uh, there's another particle that we have to measure separately other than uh, apolipoprotein B levels, and that's LP little a. And lipoprotein little a uh, is a form of LDL that is very atherogenic. However, we don't have a very good treatment to lower that now. Um, with statins don't lower LP little a. Um, there's an injectable, um, which is a PCSK9 inhibitor that can lower it by 30%. In the future, there's going to be a medication developed that's, that's been studied now that may lower LP little a by um, 80%. LP little a is important because in patients who develop aortic valve stenosis, uh, frequently it's because of elevated levels of LP little a. So we are really excited about the, the future in terms of lowering this, but it is worthwhile to check to see if one has a, um, a high level of LP little a and along with the usual lipid analysis, go ahead and have, uh, ask the um, healthcare provider to check the April lipoprotein B level. Now there are patients who have decent lipid levels but still develop coronary artery disease and we know that happens for various reasons and some that we still don't understand but here's one uh, this was uh, published in um, May of 2013, uh, information from the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, they looked at, uh, they had patients who um, took um, L-carnitine uh, or, uh, and they also um, had um, lecithin, uh, phosphatidylcholine, which comes from the yellow veggs, and L-carnitine from, most of it is from red meat, right? Uh, so they gave them um, steak and eggs or they cave the male carnitine and, and lecithin. And what we know is that lecithin, the phosphatidylcholine, L-carnitine also, uh, is metabolized by bacteria in the gut forming trimethylamine. Trimethylamine is take, uh, is, uh, goes through the liver and is changed to a free radical, TMAO, or trimethylamine N-oxide. And trimethylamine N-oxide is free radical would oxidize the LDL. It changes the LDL and it gets stuck in the vessel wall and gets engulfed by the monocytes, form uh, foam cells and in the plaque. So no matter what the cholesterol levels were in the patients, the higher the TMAO level, the more likely one would end up with a uh, sudden death, stroke, or a, uh, a heart attack. 
So that's the reason why Mayo Clinic says try to keep the eggs down to about three a week. Am I exceeding that? You said three a week? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we have to do better. Um, so now, of course, there are other reasons that one may develop um, free radicals, right? And here's a, an example of inflammation that's caused by P. gingivalis that can cause you know, um, gum disease. And this bacteria can get into the stomach circula circulation, cause inflammation, and that can oxidize LDL also, leading to the same the two plaques. So uh, I'm just pointing out there are all the reasons that one can develop plaque in the arteries other than just having a very high level of the atherogenic particles. So uh, this is a, an article that was written uh, to suggest that we should try to eradicate the burden of uh, cardiovascular disease at an earlier time in life. And they're suggesting that we look at the apolipoprotein B levels in younger people. And if there's evidence for plaque in arteries or very high cholesterol or elevated ApoB levels, Let's start treating these people. I mean, we have to maintain health. And when I say treat, I don't necessarily mean taking drugs, but making lifestyle changes. Now, so if we're going to do that, what level do we want? Um, I'll, I'll get to that at the end um, by suggesting a book that you may want to get. And, but I'll tell you what he says. Um, but <laughs> so, um, and in this, this study, it, it suggested that, as I mentioned earlier, that um, the rising rates of obesity and diabetes in the setting of suboptimal risk factor control have resulted in a similar number of cardiovascular events occurring below age 65 as above age 65. And that if nothing changes, it's projected by 2035 that nearly half of U.S. population will have some form of cardiovascular disease. That is awful. Yeah, we, we, we can... We, we have to do something about that. Is that due to diets more than sedentary style? Um, yes, I would say it is. I mean, because you can take an athlete and feed them the wrong food, and they can run a mile pretty fast, but they will die early in life from cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that... Um, that diet or how, how we eat is very important. And sometimes it's not what we eat, it's what we're not eating, right? So if we're eating a lot of greens and, um, and the fruits and vegetables, all the antioxidants that we get, um, that can make a big difference. But you take an individual who, who, <laughs> who won't eat those things. I'm, I'm, I was kind of smiling because as a teenager, I, I didn't. Um, um, so, but if you take an individual who's just eating, you know, um, a lot of animal protein, drinking a lot of cow's milk, and, you know, of course, with milk, we all know, and if we don't, we should know that mother's breast milk, after we wean from the breast, no more milk. That, that's the way it should be. Uh, unless you're invested in the milk in industry and, or, or whatever, <laughs> but, but we shouldn't do that. Yes. But it was different then, though, right? I mean, it's not the same now in terms of what we were supposed to, in terms of the, the process it, processing and, and that sort of thing. Horm hormones, yes, that's right. Um, your food is not what it used to be. Let's talk about a lipid analysis a bit more. As I mentioned, apolipid protein B, LP little A. We may as well throw in high sensitivity C reactive protein. And there are some other things that your physician may want to do, but these two are important in terms of especially apolipoprotein B to look for those atherogenic particles that we don't normally measure because if you have a pretty good LDL but this is still high then we're not lowering the, the, the factors enough. Um, so um, the level that we want to achieve with LP uh, with um, uh, apolipoprotein um, B protein B would be below 30. Um, in this book I'm going to give you the title of, he suggests in the range of 20 to 30. 
for LDL, if we're trying to reverse plaque, we uh, want to see the LDL level less than 80, which is good. Less than 70 is very good, and less than 55 is excellent uh, for that. At birth, the LDL is 30. Um, and we don't have plaque at birth. But soon after we do, <laughs> within 10 years. So what are some recommended imaging that we can do? Well, a coronary calcium score is one thing we can do. Let's pass this out. Uh, this is information on the coronary calcium score. You. Would you just pass these, some of these behind you? Sure. Please? Yeah. And this is information from uh, FMH. And uh, so if you want to, so let's talk about the coronary calcium score. Well, it's a, a CT scan of the chest. Okay, and um, it only takes about 20 to 30 seconds to do. And um, the radiation dose is uh, very low. It's uh, less than a mammogram with that. So that's not a radiation concern. And what we see, hopefully this is what we'll see on coronary calcium score, and there is no calcium within, within the blood vessels. Here's a patient with a score of 29, that's low. Here's one of 250, intermediate, and here's very high, 1,200. The score this high, you want to do something soon. If the score is above 400, then one should have a, uh, an exercise stress test, a nuclear stress test. Do you need some more? We have more. Are we out? We need more. It doesn't know the packet like this in my bag, Danielle. In my bag. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so we need to do something right away with a score of 1,200, but no need to panic because you haven't had a heart attack, and that's what we're going to prevent, right? We can um, have the person um, avoid those uh, inflammatory foods, eat uh, fruits, uh, strawberries, blueberries, strawberries, or to keep us young, blueberries to fight cancer, right? Um, nuts sparingly, a lot of greens. We get all of our vitamins from greens. There's loaded with antioxidants also. Um, now, so the score of zero, no identifiable plaque. Score of one to 10, minimal plaque. 11 to 100, definite plaque, but mild. 101 up to 400, moderate plaque. Greater than 400, there's high risk for significant three-vessel coronary disease, even in an asymptomatic person. Here's a study from Matthew Budoff looking at uh, coronary calcium scores in patients and studying the patients for about 12 years. And here, a score of zero, uh, one, uh, a score of zero uh, there was very little mortality uh, at 12 years. If you look at a score of um, 1,000, look how fast, I mean, in terms of patients dropping off in terms of increased mortality. Um, so the higher the score, more likely someone's going to have an event. So 10-year survival after adjustment for other risk factors, 99.4% uh, survival if a score of zero versus 87.8% if a score of 1,000. So a significant difference based on the amount of calcium that we have. It's not unusual for us to see the wife with a score of zero, the husband with a score of 600, 700. But we're finding these patients and we can affect the change. Because if there's plaque there, so the calcium is hard plaque. The hard plaque is not an issue. It's the soft plaque that's associated with it. And the soft plaque we can reverse. We can reverse that by changing the lifestyle, if need be, using medications to help lower the cholesterol. Um, one can live with plaque if it's stable plaque. And that's what we want to do, stabilize plaque. Here's another study looking at the same thing, that in, uh, the higher the score, the more likely one would have cardiovascular events. Now, this is a patient of mine. So I wanted a coronary calcium score. The insurance company wrote back and said, uh, wrote a letter to the patient or wrote a letter to me, you don't need a coronary calcium score because your risk is high. Okay. So I was going to go in, and so the patient came in, and I was going to just give him the news. But the score was done. So I, I guess he paid for it. Uh, but it was done. And look, just this little fleck of calcium. This patient's 67 years old, and the coronary calcium score was 47. 47, uh, which is low for someone 67. And with the score, this information, 
the physician can look up. It doesn't come out on your, it's there, but it's not printed out. This patient's coronary age was 55 to 64. That's great. Um, here's he had a score for about uh, 47, 67 year old fellow. That was good news, that's great news. Uh, so this coronary cancer score says, no, you're not at high risk. Actually, his lipid analysis suggested he was at intermediate risk. But this score tells us, no, this patient's at low risk. So um, congratulated him, and, and uh, he was very happy about that. Does supplemental calcium affect the penicillin? You know, what's suggested, that's a great question. So with this supplemental calcium, are you taking vitamin D also? Or is that person taking vitamin D also? Yeah, so, uh, and so you take K2 also. Do you take vitamin D3 plus K2? So there are, there are many more, there, there are quite a few studies now suggesting that if we take vitamin D3, we should take K2 along with it. So uh, my wife went out and bought us um, Nature Made vitamin D3 plus K2. It has the right amount of K2. And um, th with that combination, when we do absorb calcium, it's directed to the bones. You're less likely to, de to direct it to the vasculature. Uh, that, I, I don't know that that's been done in a large study, but there's quite a few small studies suggesting that, that that's what we should do. So that's what I do. If you're taking supplemental calcium, then it's recommended that you do not uh, exceed 1,500 milligrams a day so you don't get it, um, excessive. You can get calcification in other areas. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, yeah. Um, the best source of calcium is kale. You get 40% more calcium from a serving of kale than you do from a glass of milk. You actually don't get any calcium from milk. Okay. Does the kale have K? Yes. Yeah, it does. Um, this issue about vitamin D3 and K2, though, um, for patients who are on warfarin, I, I don't suggest that. I haven't studied that enough to suggest that, right? Because it, you, can, you can dose around it. Nancy, um, D3 plus K2, any knowledge on that in terms of um, whether it's a, pa a problem for patients who are on warfarin, on Coumadin? Okay. She's a clinical pharmacologist, and, and uh, she, she'll correct me if I'm wrong. Yes? Oh, no, you don't. Well, the reason why is this. Now, the protein in milk acidifies the, the blood, right? And the body takes calcium phosphate from your bones to neutralize the acidity. So we end up urinating out calcium. We don't, we don't gain from that. And uh, why, and why can't you have too many nuts, especially if you're a vegetarian? Why can't you have too many? You can. I mean, you said. Oh, sparingly. You said, yes, yeah, sparingly. Yes, uh, great question. Um, uh, because of the amount of fat, if, if, well, the issue is that if you're, you, you're not overweight, but if you're overweight, you have to be careful about the number of fat grams. Not as good fat, it's healthy fat, but it's still, you know, you, right. So people who love nuts <laughs> tend to eat a lot of them, you know. And, 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 and then some of us have loving wives, and, and like my wife will bring, bring home 10 jars of unsalted peanuts. You know, she has to get them from, what, is it Safeway? Because they don't, she, she bought them all from uh, Ferris, has no more. Well, yeah. you like a specific brand, so. Oh, that's right, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, planters. But at any rate, <laughs> yeah, but those of us who like nuts, we tend to eat too many. Yeah, but no nuts. So when I met um, Caldwell Esselstyn, who wrote the book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, he says, um, um, to stay away from nuts. So when I met Dan Butner, who wrote The Blue Zones, a year later, Butner says, I'm hungry, let's go get some nuts. <laughs> I said, well, I can't have nuts. He said, why? He said, every place, so he wrote, he, he studied people who live a long time, you know, 100 years of age, and, and so he said, everywhere that I've gone where people live a long time, they eat nuts. So I said, well, great, let's go get some nuts. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so, I did talk to Dr. Esther, and I said, well, why do you say avoid nuts? He said, well, because people just overdo it, mm -hmm. right? 
and then eating too many. In fact, uh, in oils, right, with extra virgin olive oil, well, we have Rachel Ray, right? We all saw her career. And you saw how much she gained over time, right? She really did. I'm not trying to be funny, but she did. I mean, that little tiny woman became a larger, larger woman with all this EVOO. You know, she was overdoing it with the extra virgin olive oil. Um, that's my opinion. Um, <laughs> but so, so, if, so oils have a lot of calories, so we have to be careful with that. Yeah, did that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, no, no, there are certain nuts that are better than others, right? Like those nuts that I eat, not, they're, they're, not, they're not on the list of ones where they really are protective, but almonds, um, walnuts, um, what, what else, macadamia nuts on the list? Yeah. Yeah. Good ones. Okay. Those, those were the good ones. Um, So now what's recommended by the American um, College of Cardiology is that consider uh, in adults age 40 to 75. Well, one, it's, when I was studying coronary CT uh, in California uh, for a couple of weeks, this 80-year-old lady comes in for a coronary casting score, and I was thinking, man, she's wasting her money. Her score is zero. Wow. Right? So there's uh, there, <laughs> there's data saying that, no, it's a benefit. To, to do coronary calcium scores at any age, uh, you know, th there's no upper limit, right? Um, there are reasons why an individual may want to know uh, to do that, but uh, she was not wasting her money. Now, if you have diabetes, all diabetics should take a statin. So that's why it says here, why do a coronary calcium score? Because we're gonna say you should take a statin anyway. The risk of having a heart attack is so high with diabetes that no matter how well controlled you are, what your cholesterol is, all diabetics, should take a statin. The risk of having a heart attack is very high. If you attend your risk, of, if you're intermediate risk, that's a good group to do a coronary calcium score because if the score is above 400, you're not intermediate risk, you're high risk. If the score is zero, you're not intermediate, you're low risk. Question. Yes. Uh, is this for both type one and type two, or is it different? No, for both. Okay. It is. Great question. Yeah. Um, now, we have particularly here in Alaska, many people refuse to take anything. <laughs> so sometimes we can convince them to do something, we but... We do it outside. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, so... Uh, so, uh, and then again, uh, you saw this slide already about intermediate risk patients considered doing a coronary calcium score. If your risk is very high, then one could argue just don't do it. Now, this is the book that you might consider getting, Outlive by Peter Atia. Uh, um, he's really popular with, in the medical community now. Um, he does not necessarily follow guidelines, though. He's very aggressive. He calls it Medicine 3.0, where you're going to go above and beyond to prevent disease. And he talks about the, the, four, the four horsemen, uh, the, the four uh, disease states that, that get us as we age. Uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, and Alzheimer's. Um, and in his book, he suggests that we lower the AP lipoprotein B to in the range of 20 to 30. Yes, sir. He talks about percentage of muscle mass slash strength equated with octogenarian. And uh, what have you seen about that? I have studied it. I don't know much about it, and I'm, you know, I'm learning too. Did you, so you read this book already? No, but I've yeah. seen him I'm still trying to do the thing where he it. says, where you, you stand on one foot with your eyes closed, you should be able to do that for 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm up to eight seconds now. Um, Good for you. He's got yeah. some great things. He does, yeah, so that's, this is a book that's, that's worth getting um, and reading. Uh, it's about longevity and how we can, can can live a healthier life for a longer period of time. Yeah. Strength is really important. He talks about weightlifting and maintaining strength. If you don't do weightlifting, you're going to lose your, your muscle mass. We cannot maintain muscle mass by um, just aerobic activity only. You know, another thing that I thought I would get a question about is that, you know, some of the newer medicines for um, obesity 
like um, the GLP-1 um, inhibitors uh, with uh, Ozempic, for instance. Uh, there's a suggestion that along with losing the fat, people are losing muscle and um, getting sarcopenia, uh, which is like an age-related loss of muscle. So that's concerning. However, more studies need to be done, right? Because it's because these people don't exercise or what's going on. Um, but that's, that's, that's one thing for us to, I don't know if anyone's taking an Ozempic or not, but that's just one thing. I'm not saying don't take it. I'm saying that uh, continue to do weightlifting and exercising to maintain your muscle mass. Yeah. Okay. Are the people yeah. that have a genetic predisposition to not gain all this weight and have these problems? Have these problems? So there are people who have, uh, if, there's a genotype that I did not mention that one may check, this is the neuro hospital with the surgery center. Um, uh, looking at APOE genotype, you ever heard of that APOE? There are the two twos, there are the three threes and four fours, or the two threes, you know, two fours, whatever. If you're a two two, you can eat about almost anything, you're not gonna gain weight. They're lucky. Most of us are three threes, but some of us are four fours with the APOE gen genotype, and I don't order that test because the four fours are, are 20 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's. So I'll order it, but after, only because the patient wants to know because of a family history. But there are some gene types where people don't gain, you know. Uh, there are some genetic variants too where there's no cancer and no heart disease um, in uh, Laron, Laron syndrome. Uh, but those are dwarfs actually. They don't have, um, uh, they're missing, there's a variation a variant in their growth factor. Uh, and we know that uh, insulin-like growth factor one is associated with increased risk for cancer. They don't have that. They don't have cancer, they don't have diabetes. And there's some other variations to uh, uh, genetic variants, which we may be able to learn more about and with CRISPR uh, affect the human genome to, to um, to help people to live uh, longer and healthier lives. Um, I don't know, did that answer your question too? Yeah, but there are some genetic types. If, for instance, when we do coronary calcium scores, I mean, there are people who do all the right things and have high calcium scores, and some who do all the wrong things and score zero, you know? Um, it's like that with my, 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 myself and my brother. My, <laughs> When I showed him the book by Esther about no meat, no milk, no eggs, no oil, he threw the book at me, threw it back at me. <laughs> and then we had our coronary calcium scores done, and uh, my score was over 200. His score was zero. Yeah, yeah. So that's when I became vegan. <laughs> and I'm not vegan now, I'm a pesco vegetarian now, but that's when I made that lifestyle change because I wanted to hang around to see my daughter grow up, you know? And, um, yeah. Yes, sir. For those of us who are 80 or over, it's very difficult to get a coronary risk factor less than 20%. Any kind of That's right. You, you can't because of, yes, I saw a patient today who's 80, and we talked about that. However, um, this 80-year-old was going to be work, doing, doing some work on his roof or whatever. <laughs> you know, and, you know, if you're alive and you love living, we, uh, let me say this. If you take a, um, an 80-year-old person who is on a statin, a group of 80-year-olds are on statins, and you take the statin away, there's increased risk for heart attack in, in, in those who don't take the statin. So there's benefit in lowering cholesterol and, and uh, whatever testing that needs to be done. I mean, if, if that's, uh, we love in America. We, we have, we're free to to be evaluated. You know, we don't have a cutoff for where we say, ah, you know, forget you or whatever. Yeah, so no, if you want the testing done. But you're right, if you do the risk analysis, it's gonna say your risk is, because in, the, in our country we die from heart, heart disease and cancer, so the risk is gonna be high at age 80, just based on, based on age. Um, but this is a risk score, it's a suggestion, it doesn't know, and that's why we have to do other testing too, right? Uh, to look at like the DEXA, to look at the distribution of fat or the coronary calcium score. And even if you see 
A lot of calcification, don't worry. Just make sure that we stabilize the soft plaque. And we do that with an anti-inflammatory diet and adding medications when we have to. And when Esselstyn reversed heart disease in his group, he used a statin to, if he needed to, to get the total cholesterol down below 150. And uh, I saw a patient today, her total cholesterol, she had three, she had, had uh, uh, coronary bypass surgery. She was concerned about her sister, who's supposed to come in to see me because everyone's had a heart attack or whatever. We looked at her lipid levels, this patient today, her total cholesterol was 97. Her HDL was 34, which is low, right? But her LDL was 37, you know? Uh, and there's another number we can look at, the non-HDL cholesterol. You su subtract the HDL from total cholesterol, you want that below 100. Hers was 64. And I just congratulated her. I said, you know, grazing animals, elephants and horses, don't develop atherosclerotic heart disease, have an average cholesterol of 100. Hers was 97, you know, which is great. Yeah. And so she was taking a statin, and she was taking a medicine called Zetia. And those two medications, along with her diet, you know, so this patient has a very good chance of not having another cardiac event. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, in terms of PET scanning, actually, we could do a better job on having tests that are more accurate uh, with PET scanning, particularly in larger patients. And uh, Lee, did you do PET scans before coming here? Yes, so Dr. Pearson did PET scans. And so we have someone who was already trained in doing them. If you can get, we can get a scanner. Just so you know, that's my pet project at the American Board, is to get a PET scanner. And Kari knew I'd ask that question. <laughs> that's great. Nuts. Yeah. Now, in terms of uh, AFib and uh, risk factors, um, <clears throat> well, uh, just uh, maintaining a normal body weight uh, is good. Uh, as we, for individuals overweight, uh, for every, I, I think it's a kilogram or so that they lose, maybe it's a pound, it, the risk goes down by maybe 1%. So just maintaining um, appropriate body weight. One thing that we see frequently is um, dehydration. Um, so make sure you drink plenty of fluids. The minimum to reduce your risk of a heart attack by 50% is five 8 ounce glasses of water a day. Uh, that's from the Adventist Health Trial, the second health trial. And that was in, they mentioned that in men, but uh, women may need even less. So women, they're stronger, right? So they may need less, but at least 40 ounces of liquid a day. We should drink whatever your body weight is, uh, divide that by, um, by two. And this is the number of ounces of liquid we need a day. You can't count coffee because you urinate out the same amount you take in. And of course, alcohol is dehydrating. Uh, sleep apnea is another risk factor for AFib. Another com sleep apnea, if you have that, uh, treat that. There's another common risk factor for that. Uh, thyroid problems, so make sure that's checked. Okay. You mentioned uh, AFib, and I was curious what you thought about magnesium and vitamin. Well, yeah, low magnesium levels has increased risk for AFib. Vitamin C, uh, I, I, I try not to say anything really negative about it because of Linus Pauling, who was such an advocate for vitamin C. Uh, another thing about Linus Pauling is that, um, so he did the first analysis on blood to, to, um, to reveal the, uh, the, the genetic um, problems or the problem with hemoglobin in sickle cell anemia. And that unit of blood that he studied was sent to him from Charity Hospital in New Orleans. That's why I was trained in, in New Orleans, so, um, and George Birch sent him that unit of blood. So for vitamin C, it's an antioxidant. Um, we have to be careful about not overdoing it with antioxidants. Uh, there was a study looking at that and found that in people who do a lot of antioxidants in terms of supplements, actually had uh, increased risk for problems. So we should get antioxidants from, from our food. And um, so I wouldn't overdo it with, with the vitamin C. So a lot of people felt that, well, well the B vitamins and C uh, are water soluble, you urinate them out, you can't do any harm, but that's not necessarily true. 
when we used to give prescription B vitamins to lower homocysteine levels, a study was done looking at that and there were increased risks for stroke. Yeah. Yes. Uh, statins, uh, you seem to read a lot about different types providing actually additional complications and things uh, for people like muscle problems and that sort. So is there anything that can be used other than statins to have the same effect? Other than diet, for example. Yeah, so uh, we used to really be concerned about uh, the muscle problems and, and liver with, with statins that the risk for that is low, uh, is, is very low. It does happen, but it's low. Well, one thing about the most problems, we can offset that uh, by patients using coenzyme Q10. Um, uh, in this book by Peter Thiel, he mentions that for his patients who can't take statins, he recommends bepidoric acid. I thought about you, Lee, when I saw that. He mentioned bepidoric acid. Um, there are other medicines for people that we have to say, a patient statin intolerant, and there are some other medications that are not statin. Now, PCSK9 inhibitors is, is one, but it's, it's an injectable that people one would do twice a month. Um, one can really work with your diet and see how much you can get done with that. You know, generally it does take a little bit of a statin or some other medication to help with it, though. So yeah. With it, because in the cascade, it's a statin pre prevents the production of, of cholesterol. But in that cascade of what's not being produced is coenzyme Q10. So we give it a supplement to, to offset that. Yeah, it's a supplement. And one can stay on a lower dose of a statin too if you take azitimib along with it. Like a patient today with those great numbers was on half the usual dose that I would give for a statin. And she was taking 10 milligrams of azitimib, which is not a statin. But alone, azetamib doesn't bring cholesterol down enough. Yeah. Do you ever put cholesterol off as a supplement that the cancer area uses? That's my stanol acid. Stanol, yeah, yeah. Uh, the stanols do work. I think Benacol was one of them, too. There was a product on the market. Yeah, so if you do something like that, it's worth, it's okay. Just measure the levels to see how you're doing, right? And this, yeah, yeah, to get, yeah, and in fact, when Elston did his study, he checked, which we can't do because the insurance companies won't pay for it, but he checked the, his patient's cholesterol every month to see how they were doing. Yes, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, the plant stanols are, are fine to do. Um, some people don't tolerate them, um, maybe because of gastric upset and that sort of thing, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not invested in, in statins. I am invested in preventing heart attacks, okay. especially if you're a taxpayer. <laughs> well, we all pay taxes at some point in time. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> What's that? You had a question. You work tomorrow? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Um, well, okay. on, Thank on you. behalf of uh, the university and the Healthy Living, Dr. Romero. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.